Thank you, everybody, for coming to hear me wibbling on about this. And um, I'm glad it wasn't raining. I'd just like to say I'm overwhelmed by the welcome I've had at this university. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And as you'll see in a minute, I have an inspiration to go on for a long time. Not in this talk, but just in general. Once I can get the hang of the buttons. Okay, just briefly, a few words about clinical trials. There can be various different sorts of them. It could be observational, so you go out with a clipboard and collect information. A slightly more sophisticated version of that is if you try and match your case subjects and your control subjects in various ways. For instance, closely similar ages, genders, socio-demographic distribution, anything else that may be of relevance. But all these observational trials are very much at the mercy of bias. Interventional trials can be just the same. You can still, if you like, observe all the people who've been given a tablet and all the people who haven't and see how they fare differently. But again, that's completely open to bias. The gold standard is randomized trials. Ethically, if you genuinely aren't sure whether a treatment is better than not, you don't think it's going to kill the patient. You think it might do some good, but you're not sure. But with the patient's agreement, they'll say, OK, doc, it's up to you. Um, I'll just do what you think is best. So then you can toss a coin. Heads, you take the pill. Tails, you don't. And because each patient coming for treatment of some sort gets a coin toss with their agreement. All the other variables, such as ages, heights, weights, state of health, even out when you've tossed the coin a sufficient number of times. So really, the only thing that's different between the people who are getting heads and the people who are getting tails is uh, that one lot get the treatment and the other don't. Or nowadays, it's generally not ethical to give nothing. So you would give best current treatment or best current treatment plus something else which may or may not be helpful. We want to avoid bias at all costs. It stands to reason. And tossing a coin or electronically getting a computer to generate random numbers or something like that, or having envelopes which you open with um, A's and B's inside or little bits of card are fine. Sometimes when trials like this have been conducted, there's been cheating. The nurses have steamed open the envelopes and given the active treatment more to the people who they think are more in need of it. That completely messes up the trial and introduces a huge bias and destroys the interpretability of it. Uh, finally, power. It's a word statisticians seem to be fond of. They always talk about power calculations. We just want big numbers very big numbers. These two chaps, Richard Pito on the left, Richard Dole on the right, have been my inspiration and it's been my great privilege to work with them both in Oxford for a long time. Richard Dole was still working into his 90s and uh, Richard Pito came along later and became his protege. Dole is no longer with us, I'm afraid, but Richard Pito, although he's officially retired now, is still very active. That pile of paper you can see behind them is very largely stuff that came out of my computer, I'm sorry to say, but that's another story. So I'm briefly going to tell you about Doll's big one, the British doctor's study. It's a prospective cohort study, no coin tossing or anything, it's simply observational. So. Dole was involved throughout from 1951 to 2001 when, when it was wrapped up. He started working with Austin Bradford Hill till 61, and Richard Pito joined in 71. They followed two thirds of all the British doctors who were registered practitioners uh, around 1951 throughout their lives to see what might be associated with their deaths. And um, at that time, they weren't sure what the principal reasons for good and bad health and longevity might be, other than the obvious things. And um, 
smoking was an issue. Dole had a suspicion about that. But the high prevalence of lung cancer in Britain in the middle of the last century, he thought equally it might be something like fumes from motor cars, or it might be fumes from the tarmac on the roads, or something of that sort. But uh, interviewing people, and in particular uh, his work looking at people who'd um, had autopsies and uh, the lung cancer was there. Um, when he looked at their notes, he could almost bet that they had been smokers. By 1956, the evidence was absolutely crystal clear that smoking was bad, caused lung cancer and heart trouble, heart attacks, and many other things too. But this was published and much ignored by the British public, who increased their smoking habits after that, and I'll show you that later on. But briefly, th this is what Dole found. In the top diagram is essentially aliveness as a function of age. So everybody starts off alive at age 35, and they go down and are all practically all dead at 100. But if you're a smoker, you lose 10 years of your life, just like that. Can't do that. But if you stop smoking, you very soon join the dotted line and the persistent hazards of smoking, assuming you haven't already got cancer or a heart condition, go away. So there is hope for people who give up smoking in middle age that they will still have a long and happy life without this curse. Now, the early breast cancer trialists collaborative group, which I'll call EBCTCG for short, although it's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, there's some dispute about how to spell trialists. No dictionaries seem to agree, but uh, the American spelling is preferred with one L generally. It began about 1984, spearheaded headed by Richard Pito and uh, his future merry band, uh, quoting a song about Captain Beaky, the small mad duck, and his merry band writing wrongs, uh, which you may have heard long ago. I couldn't resist putting that in, although it's a bit unfair to Richard. He doesn't look like that. Uh, but Richard was addressing another major cancer scourge in Western countries where other things tend not to get you first, such as um, tuberculosis or malaria and other uh, rampant diseases of that sort. Um, having put lung cancer to rights, breast cancer was the next thing to put to rights. This addresses a major public health issue on a par with the consequences of smoking, where even modest improvements in treatments could have major implications in at least the Western world. This sentence seems to be what I've just said, more or less, where other larger scourges, infant mortality, TB, war, HIV, AIDS, have been more or less controlled, if not eradicated. Now, doing it properly is absolutely key. And as I said, randomized is the way to do it. These randomized trials are so much more reliable and trustworthy than all the observational trials and all the control case matched trials and so on, that the study has totally dealt only with randomized trials. Even the largest standalone randomized trials were struggling to provide definitive answers to the question, when a breast cancer patient has had a successful operation to remove the tumor, um, in other words, the disease was fortunately early at that point, what to do to keep things that way? You don't want the disease coming back again, and as you probably know with cancer, it can lurk and then pop up again in an unwelcome way, often long afterwards. So there's a magic trick in statistics. Uh, we can pool all of the individual randomized trials in an unbiased way to get the necessary power thanks to log rank analysis. Now, there were some large trials in the USA where the trialists thought, oh, well, we've got several thousand patients in our trial. That's bound to be enough to answer the question definitively as to whether treatment A or treatment B works or doesn't work. As it turned out, because we're looking at moderate treatment effects, we're not looking at splinting a leg in order for the bone to grow straight again. It's a much lower level of certainty than that. 
that um, that wasn't enough. And there was a great deal of resistance to the idea of pooling different trials together. The few people with big trials said, ha, huh, we'll go it alone. Thank you, we don't need any help from you. But after a while, they capitulated one by one and grudgingly started to share their data. Now, this was a great diplomatic effort. An overview can be unbiased if and only if we can include all of the properly randomized trials in the world, published or unpublished. Even so, there tend to be reasons why people decide to run these trials, and that is a bias of its own. But in this case, aiming it at people with breast cancer is a good enough motivation, and there are so many trials, we hope that these wrinkles have been ironed out. It was a huge international diplomatic effort to bring trialists on side and to explore their networks to bring as many more into the fold as possible, including all of those whose results were disappointing, often to the extent of never seeing the light of day. So this included going into hospital basements and braving spiders and looking at dusty old files and gradually retrieving case histories and piecing together the trials that never made it into print because the editors weren't very interested. All the trialists got despondent and moved on to something else. Um, nowadays, chasing up the historical stuff where the trialists might already have lost interest, retired or died, is a major effort. And there's a team of oh, 15 people or so who spend most of their working lives trying to get hold of the remaining data and following up the people who are in trials where the trialists have by now moved on. And I'll come to the problem of that. Historically, the first overview process began in 1984. And the data were sought from all the randomized trials of system systemic adjuvant therapy. That's things that you put into the body, that moves around uh, after the surgery has been done to stop the cancer coming back. And soon afterwards, also local therapy, such as radiotherapy and different types of surgery. <coughs> the meta-analysis concept met huge initial resistance. People didn't understand it. They didn't trust the statisticians. And it was only by example showing how piles, sorry, trials could be validly piled up together in the correct way that um, the resistance began to wane. Nowadays, everybody and their dog will immediately do a randomized trial if there's any uncertainty in medicine and then go on to do a meta-analysis if there's at least one other trial <coughs> Uh, so collaboration was sought and built and maintained, and this has been going on now for 30 years plus, um, though, again, stormy weather approaches, but I'll get to that. So trust and confi confidentiality for shared data and results. What we were doing was asking the trialists to give us their unpublished patient records so we could analyze them properly. And that means that, uh, in principle, somebody could steal the results and publish, or photograph the slides in the meeting and run away with them. All sorts of things were possible. But in those days, at least, there was honor amongst scientists with the greatest of respect, possibly more so than in some areas today. And people were mostly very willing to share all their data, or at the very least, to give body counts on the back of an envelope. So treatment A, half died. Treatment B, a third died. And there were 500 in my study. Do what you can with that. So we would put that into the sausage machine as well and turn the handle. It all helped. And then they would be shamed into giving us their real data once they saw how everything was meshing together nicely. So trialists were, a, and still are really, a democratic association of equals. Uh, I'll reserve comments about certain drug companies until later. A secretariat was set up based at the cl Clinical Trial Service Unit in Oxford, and that's still running today. It's grown quite a bit because the enormity of the task wasn't fully appreciated at the outset. And besides, there would have been resistance and it would possibly never have come off the ground. So for the overview of all these trials, the data were canvassed from all the trialists, checked for internal consistency. There was a lot of toing and froing corresponding with the trialists to iron out things that didn't make sense. For example, the randomization might have changed its balance between 
the two groups partway through, and they would say, oh, actually, we had a third allocation. It was a three-sided coin. You'd better have the third one as well, or the fourth. And gradually, the trial structure was clarified. The way that data were coded, which was often pretty ropey, was cleaned up, and we had a very high-quality data set in almost all cases. There were one or two fraudulent trials. Uh, we got to the bottom of those by looking at suspiciously beautiful results, but that was really very much the minority, sub-percent level amongst trialists. Um, methodology, each trial is analyzed separately, so women in one trial are compared directly only with women in the same trial. And the results, the analyses were stratified by age and nodal status, which is how much the cancer has spread from the original site through the lymphatic system into, first of all, nodes in the armpit and in the midline and uh, around the tummy and later on other places. Um, so people who have started to get nodes involved, one could regard as being in worse shape and they may well not respond so well to treatment. So we can stratify and look at the young ones, the old ones, the good nodal status, the bad nodal status, and a number of other things to see what effects these are having on, first of all, overall survival, and secondly, on whether the treatment is helping it. So each trial gives one log rank statistic, at least from each of these strata. And the magic log rank method enables you to add up the observed minus expected, that is, the number of people in the treatment allocation who died take away the number who would have died if the mortality rate had been the same as in the controls, and its variance, which is a measure of information content. And you can just linearly add the O minus E's, linearly add the V's, and then you can get the odds ratio from th th these pooled results. I will show you a diagram of this later, but it's a bit tough on the eyes. So the methodology, individual patient data, because then you can stratify by everything you've got measures of. Um, if you've just got a back of envelope with a number of bodies, that's better than nothing, but a lot less better. So the dates of randomization, the recurrences, both local ones, contralateral, meaning the other side, breast, and distant, which might be anywhere else further in the body and the death and its cause, if available. The treatment allocation, so did they get A or B with the coin toss? And quite often, there will be two things being randomized at the same time in these trials. So there will actually be four different allocations. So the, the coin has four sites, if you like. Age, menopausal status, that is whether they're still uh, of a child bearing age or whether they're older because that has a big effect on the, um, some of the hormonal um, goings on in the body and uh, some tumours respond to oestrogen for instance. Nodes, that's spreading through the lymphatic system as I've explained. Hormone receptor status, oestrogen receptor in the tumour, that is a sign that the tumour might respond to hormonal treatment progesterone receptor, that's another one. And it turned out quite early on that that has practically no relevance. It's not a predictor of whether a treatment is going to work or not in any credible way, which simplifies life a bit. But latterly, a growing list of other things, including HER2, anthropometrics, height, weight, genetic markers, tumor size, tumor grade, um, the list is getting almost intractably long. So each time we go back to the trialists, we ask them to dig out more and more information about the patients as they were at presentation, as well as whether they're still alive and whether their disease has come back. So the outcomes we're looking at are the first appearance, reappearance of breast cancer. That can be local or distant, sometimes one before the other. It includes contralateral breast cancer, which is usually hard to distinguish from a genuine second primary without histology. So if a tumour does appear in the other breast, it's generally assumed that it's a spread of the first tumour. Though if they've actually looked at the cell type, some can be identified as being a quite separate tumour that popped up 
unrelated to the first one, other than a general predisposition of the patient to have breast cancer possibly. But it's only in a few percent of cases that one can histologically verify that the contralateral cancer is a different one. And the other outcome is death, of course. Unknown causes are generally included with deaths from breast cancer uh, on the grounds that people are more likely to die of that if the cause of death hasn't been stated, although it's a very poor second because you might be cured of a tumour and then 20 years later you'll run over by a bus. Should you really still be down as a breast cancer death? I'm not sure, but I'm happy with that. Uh, problem about death without recurrence. If the recurrence has come and they die fairly soon afterwards, even if we don't have a cause of death, it might be fair enough to assume it was then the cancer coming back uh, and taking over. And of course, under those circumstances, the trialist will usually give the patient everything they've got just to keep them going and following them up becomes less relevant to the original question. So outcomes, breast cancer related deaths, which are deaths from or with breast cancer. There are other popular causes of death, heart, stroke, other cancers, but breast cancer tends to be the uh, major one until we follow people up to a very old age and then of course something else might well get them if they survive from the breast cancer. But over the study age range, which tends to be under 70, the breast cancer is the big killer. This is not intended as an eye test. I'm sorry about this. You've probably heard of forest plots. What happened in 1984 and 85 was we got all the trialists together in a room at a hotel near Heathrow Airport and showed them vast numbers of unintelligible computer printout hieroglyphics. And they were much bemused by all this. And we thought, we have got to have a graphical way of showing things. So this is where forest plots originated. By 1986 or so, we had essentially invented these things and they've caught on and become pretty universal. So once you're familiar with a forest plot, you'll see them popping up all over the place and you'll immediately know how to read them like a map. But for those of you who aren't familiar, please forgive me while I just go through this for a moment. Stand in front of the screen, go out of the mic range, etc. This is a list of the trials, which are almost too fuzzy for me to read here. Uh, a list of the treatment group, which is the number of people who died divided by the total number of people who are allocated tamoxifen in this case. And then for the control group, the same, the number who died out of the number in the group. And then O minus E and V, as I've mentioned, these statistics that are used to create the log rank pooled result. These are the results on the right. This is the odds ratio from zero, which is a perfect cure, up to one, which is the solid line, which means treatment is no better or no worse than nothing, up to infinity over there. But very few of the lines go too far off the plot. The blob is the actual odds ratio of a particular trial. And that's really how likely is the improvement in outcome uh, in terms of a benefit on the left or a hazard on the right. The confidence intervals, 95% actually, you're probably familiar with those. They just show the extent of uncertainty for a particular trial. Here are lots of trials. All of them are too small to give a statistically significant result. Even the big squares, and the square is proportional to the variance or the information content of the trial, so big trials with lots of deaths get bigger squares. No good, can't really tell anything. But if you pull them, you get a diamond which is now significantly off the line of no effect towards the line of benefit. So one year of tamoxifen, which is a cheap off-patent drug like aspirin, you take it every day, it has a few side effects, but they're not intolerable. Mind you, I wouldn't care for the dryness of mouth, all kinds of things of that sort. Um, will bump your life expectancy quite considerably. If you take it for two years or so, pooling all the results much more considerably, look at these p-values, lots of zeros in front of the one. Impossible for that to have arisen by the play of chance. And then for five or more years, even stronger effect. 
So that's what's called a meta-regression, to use another scary word, showing that the longer you give it, the better the treatment effect. And that's the grand pool result. That box contains all of the trials, and that line says tamoxifen is brilliant if you have an estrogen receptor responsive tumor at the beginning, because tamoxifen being a hormonal agent only seems to work on those. You'll be relieved to hear that there won't be much more of these forest plots, but that's to give you a flavor of the enormous numbers of trials, the enormous numbers of people in them, and the very strong effects that one can get. A few of these boxes are actually big enough, these individual trials. Later on, people realize they really would need seriously big trials to get a significant result on their own, and they've just about made it in some cases for the later, longer treatment regimens. So the overview, so as not, not to miss any moderate differences in short-term survival, the world's trialists have shared their data every five years since 85, so right up to 2010. This is now trial year again, overview year again, 2015, but, and I'll come back to that. Well, for one thing, no, oh, never mind. Um, so we need all of the main randomized trial results to get large enough numbers and to avoid undue emphasis on particular studies. If there were just a few of those big boxes in the world and nothing else, we would get something that wasn't really true of the pool result. Um, problems arise out data entropy. The data belong to data managers at the various research institutes. They get moved from one computer system to another. The data managers don't understand what they've got often the identities of the uh, subjects are scrambled up as well. So when we ask for an update, we get a new file which we cannot tally with the old file without a lot of detective work. If we've still got dates, we can often lock most of the subjects down using their randomization dates. But if we've just got a new file, somebody has very cleverly constructed ab initio in a different way, we're largely stumped and quite often the noise in these subsequent issues gets bigger and bigger. Variables are left out, other things are reclassified into fewer subdivisions and generally noise creeps in and damages what was originally a really tight ship. Over legislation, now there are regulations in some countries where you are not allowed to use trial material for any thing other than the original purpose you said you were going to collect for at the beginning. Now, of course, we have new ideas about things that might influence the outcomes of these treatments, and we're skating on thin ice actually analyzing some trials where these things were not foreseen. After all, if we knew all these things at the beginning, we could just go home and feed the dog, and nobody would have to do these things. And commercial confidentiality, this is a mortal enemy number one now, the big drug companies with their new expensive drugs, which they're making a lot of money from, um, insist on, on embargoing the results, often for two or three years. And although we may be party to the results in camera, we can't let on what they are. I find this is heartbreaking. I know things that I would just love to tell the press about what's good and what's bad, and I just mustn't, because otherwise, trust would fall away and in the future it'd be even more difficult to get collaboration. But the truth will out in the end. So a, a quick history, 84, 85 meetings at hotels of the, the original trialists of some of the big important trials. And then we frantically try to get all of the smaller trials and the unpublished ones and every five years we had consensus meetings. Things slipped a bit in 2005 because there was just overload, so that meeting spread over two years, not literally, but a couple of days in each of the two years. And 2010, there was a successful meeting, but at that time, politics started to creep in. Splinter groups were forming, for example, a subgroup analyzing overviews of aromatase inhibitors, which is another type of hormonal treatment for breast cancer. And although we're collaborating with these splinter groups, they're not so happy with each other, and the whole idea of a collaboration may well be of limited future shelf life. So more and more sub-meetings since 2010, very depressing, very time-consuming, and 
um, quite demoralizing for some. So I'm just going to summarize very quickly the results from the various five yearly overviews. In 85, it was demonstrated tamoxifen improved survival. And that big forest plot I showed you is, is the end result of that. So right away, people started taking tamoxifen um, very much more than they had previously. CMF, that's cyclophosphamide methotrexate and 5-fluorouracil, a very popular cocktail of drugs uh, for cancer, uh, improved survival, definitely. And ovarian ablation improved survival. That is moving the patient artificially into a menopausal state, either by removing the ovaries, which is a bit drastic, or by giving them stuff which deactivates them, which is much more how it's done nowadays, fortunately. In 1990, longer tamoxifen seemed better. You recall that the five-year lot did better than the one-year lot. The tamoxifen effect greater in estrogen receptor positive women, as I've mentioned. It reduced the rate of contralateral breast cancer and by implication recurrence too. Uh, chemotherapy effective in uh, both older and younger women. So although it's unpleasant, it seems to work regardless of age, whereas tamo tamoxifen is better for the older ones where they are postmenopausal, but it's still worth considering at any age. Single agent chemotherapy, that is just a single drug, is less effective than polychemotherapy. And even then it was falling out of use, although there were numerous very small trials of various different single agents. And if you're going to have a horrible intervention like chemotherapy, you might as well take the best and get it over with as quickly as possible. Immuno immunotherapy was postulated as maybe being good for cancer on the grounds that in those days people thought perhaps it was related to infection, but it just didn't work and has now fallen off the map. In 95, uh, the five years of tamoxifen was now showing a huge magnitude of effect, clearly better than one or two years, prevented contralateral only in those with ER positive. So that implies that um, it was either spread from the original ER positive tumor or that any new tumors were of a similar type to the original one. Anthracycline, which is a, a stronger um, variety of uh, chemotherapy agents, such as doxorubicin or adriamycin, as it's known uh, for epidoxorubicin and other things, are better than CMF. So we began to see FAC, FEC, things like that, which were clearly very promising and no more horrible for the patient, fortunately, than the old CMF, where they would generally be given six cycles. That was a, a standard sort of dose. And then they would be left alone to grow their hair and perhaps take tamoxifen. In 2000, 15-year um, effects of chemo sustained in both older and younger women. Uh, chemo effect appeared greater in ER poor than in ER positive disease. And this was pounced on a lot uh, in, in uh, the professional press. And it turned out it was wrong. It was actually um, just that the data were not sufficiently stable at that point. And eventually we found that ER poor or ER positive, that is whether or not you have hormone receptors in the tumor, chemotherapy works equally well. Did that change? Uh, yes. 2000, 15 year effects of five years of TAM sustained of great magnitude, tremendously small error bars, way off the line of no effect. Door open to question of five years versus longer tamoxifen. So trials of things like 10 years versus five started. And there was a campaign that everybody should take it, whether or not they had breast cancer, just to ward off the possibility of it arriving. But I think that's going a bit far because it does have side effects. Um, ovarian suppression or ablation effective, but not significantly so when added to chemo. So people thought, well, perhaps the chemotherapy is actually shutting down the ovaries anyway, and um, maybe we don't need to do anything additional and horrible. 2005, um, the previous overview eventually got published. It took five years to get there in this case because the whole system was creaking under the strain. Trialists met, steering committee, lots of politics, many new trials added, 
more woman years of follow-up for all the major questions, but major trials still missing, largely because of the drug companies, unfortunately, and a few personalities who just insisted on doing things by themselves. That's usually the case in any area of science. 2010, trialists met new questions, types of anthracycline-based regimen examined, stronger or different types or bigger doses. Taxane trials. This is a, a newer agent made from yew tree poison, amazingly enough, which seems to be very effective. The side effects are still very unpleasant, as with chemotherapy, but it does vibe favorably in terms of outcomes. Aromatase inhibitors, which are new and very expensive, and broadly speaking, being hormonal work on people with uh, receptor-positive tumors, and being expensive, they're pushed by the drug companies, and the jury is still out as to whether they're safe in the long term. Then there's Herceptin, or Trazostumab. You've probably heard of HER2, which is um, a marker they've discovered where tumors with HER2 respond favorably to Herceptin and similar agents. So by identifying whether a patient has HER2 positive, you can try this stuff out on them preferentially. Chemoendocrine therapy, that's giving chemotherapy and tamoxifen or um, AIs only in estrogen receptor positive pre- and postmenopausal subsets seems to work, but as with ordinary endocrine therapy, not in ER poor. And then there's local regional therapy, which I've not said much about. That is radiotherapy and um, surgery of various kinds. Now, another dreaded forest plot. This is the last one, I promise you. Um, this is what happens if you stratify the data. In this case, it's people who die with a recurrence of breast cancer in trials of anthracycline-based regimens versus nothing. This is the new things like doxorubicin. And I'm going to go over here and peer at this little monitor and then point my arrow up there. We break people, we break all the trials down into different subgroups to see if belonging to a particular subgroup matters. This is different strengths of the chemotherapy. This is different types of anthracyclines. This is whether or not they're also getting hormonal treatment. That means they have an ER positive um, tumor. Age, nodal status, so zero means no spread. Four plus means four or more lumps have appeared outside the original site of the tumor already. Estrogen receptor status and combinations with age. Now, what we see is that nothing matters. This chemotherapy works for everybody. They're all way off the line of no effect. Very strong benefit, regardless of anything like how strong the... Well, actually, a bit for the very high dose, a bit stronger effect. Um, but the type of agent doesn't matter. Concurrent other treatment doesn't matter. So the hormonal and chemo don't interact with each other, which can be a problem in some trials. Age doesn't matter much. You might argue there's a little trend. Here are the oldies of 70 plus. There's a tiny signal. For some reason, regrettably, they don't do many trials in people over 70. Um, I hope that they will benefit from the outcomes of trials done on the younger people because they seem <coughs> to benefit where they do appear quite strongly, although that's far from significant. And then whether or not they've got nasty nodes doesn't matter. Uh, receptors doesn't matter. The message here is that we stratified, we've looked for things that might be confusing each other, moving in opposite directions, for instance. Absolutely nothing. Clean bill of health for chemotherapy. Therefore, take it. And I hope I never will have to. Right. Another sort of analysis, very similar, um, is actually doing one of those forest plots every year. So if you imagine, this is actually all the information in the bottom part of the huge forest I showed you. But now we're looking at how people die over 15 years. If you are a controlled patient, 40% will be dead. 
if you take tamoxifen for about five years, only a third are dead. And you can just see tiny error bars on those spots. That's how well determined that life table curve is. And of course, you can carry it on to 20, 25 years, etc., until the noise becomes so extreme that the lines are zigging and zagging all over and crossing. And then you just have to wait patiently and go out and accrue data at the next one or two or three five year cycles until you've got enough. And then you can see what the signal is. But this is a nice, clean demonstration of how. Although people were taking it for the first five years, there's a carryover effect. So even after, well, more than 10 years, the fact they took it at the beginning is still having an effect on their subsequent life course. So you may not have to take something like this chronically, but once you've taken it, the benefit persists, possibly for life. So I'll just talk you briefly through the size of these various comparisons. Uh, hormonal therapy, that's things like tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors, and doing things to the ovaries. 115,000 women in 179 randomized trials. This makes it possible to do some of these subgroup analyses I showed you in the previous big forest. So you can look at the effects of age and nodes and other things. So often in a small trial, there is so little power there is so little signal that all you can do is look at the bottom line. But here we've been able to deconstruct things in quite a lot of detail. And so tamoxifen versus not, longer versus shorter, TAM, and the newer AIs, quite a decent number in each of those collections of trials. Polychemotherapy, 105,000 in 126 trials. And again, taxanes are now hot stuff, 45,000 taxane. Um, subjects, 31,000 poly versus not, 22,000 anthracycline versus CMF, uh, 5,000 of more versus less anthracycline. Ethically nowadays, nobody would get not. So most of these trials comparing something with not are the older ones that have been running since the days when we genuinely weren't sure whether the treatment worked at all or whether it was hazardous. Uh, nowadays, it would not be ethical to start a trial like that, and one just has to use X or X plus Y and see whether the effect of Y helps. So for receptor, estrogen receptor positive cases, tamoxifen for about five years, 40% uh, reduction in contralateral breast cancer, 38% in recurrence, 30% in breast cancer death, 22 in all sorts of death. So being run over by a bus is still a possibility. But a four times increased hazard of endometrial cancer. That's the lining of the womb. It is a very low hazard, but a fourfold increase is potentially worrying. But compared with the risk of dying from breast cancer, and since endometrial cancer is readily treated, um, it's probably a not a good contraindication. With AIs, uh, there's a smaller reduction in recurrence than tamoxifen, but an improved reduction in mortality. Uh, there's a possibly stronger effect if you give them two years of TAM and then switch to AI, but the uh, jury is still out over AIs generally, particularly because of osteoporosis. It's suspected if you've been taking them long term that your risk of osteoporosis may be considerably increased. But because these things have not been around long enough, we haven't seen that yet. Polychemotherapy, the traditional CMF or anthracycline and cyclophosphamide, 20 to 30% decrease in recurrence, 10 to 30% decrease in breast cancer mortality. Anthracyclines versus CMF, an additional 10 or 20% improvement. And taxanes versus other things, 10 to 20% improvement. Bearing in mind that chemo and hormonal are additive, you can take both and double your chances of survival. So um, these cumulatively give quite strong therapeutic benefits. And the third side of the um, palette is local therapy. Here we've got 63,000 in 103 trials. Large reduction in local recurrence. You zap the tumor site, it doesn't come back for a long time if it hasn't already spread out. And there's still a reduction in the 15-year breast cancer mortality, so that's probably happening to some extent. 
But when we were following those life table curves out, following the trials up to 20, 25, 30 years, later rising hazards <coughs> appeared, which was very unwelcome. Um, they're now largely overcome. The radiotherapists were outraged when we were finding that the patients receiving it were starting to die of heart-related diseases, diseases of the great arteries and things like that um, because the radiotherapy was actually damaging organs inside the chest. Now it's a much more exact science and much more targeted just to the tumour site and this overkill is much less of a problem than it was back in the 50s and 60s. Surgery, this is often evaluated in combination with radiotherapy methods and quite difficult to unravel sometimes. Overtreatment is much less prevalent than it was historically, thank goodness. Uh, fairly standard therapy long ago was to remove not only the breast and as much else as you could of the patient, but her arm too. Um, that fortunately proves completely absurdly over the top and is never considered anymore. So the bottom line of this overview process is local and systemic therapies give several moderate survival gains. Um, improvements in early detection, such as breast screening, local control, hormonal therapy, and chemo have in aggregate substantially reduced national mortality rates. Going back to the doctor's smoking study, if you recall, in 1956, Dole and his collaborators published the paper saying definitively, smoking killed you from lung cancer and heart disease. People were very unimpressed and their cigarette consumption in the UK continued up until past 1970. Now, of course, it is kicking in and uh, the media have battened onto the hazards of smoking and public perceptions of it have completely changed. But there was a long lead time from the discovery to its effect on public health. With breast cancer, this is uh, the death rate from breast cancer with the year along the bottom again. If you recall, we started this overview process about 1985-ish, and there was a very quick reaction. The health professionals very quickly changed their prescribing and treatment uh, practices, and in the UK, and the USA, which epidemiologically had a smaller breast cancer <coughs> problem. I don't know why that is. Um, both dropped dramatically. And in fact, around 1900, the rates were down here, um, which was because people were dying of other things like TB and, and so forth. Now they're still plummeting down. This isn't quite up to date, 2010, but they're still falling. And with luck, we'll be back to the sort of 1900 baseline within the next few years. So this is why I showed a bit about the smoking and a bit about the breast cancer. This is female cancer deaths. This is breast going up from 1950 to 2010 in the UK and in the USA, where, as you recall, the rates were a bit lower, but the same shape. This is lung climbing all through the uh, um, century until about 1985, and then dropping rapidly, largely uh, as a response to Dole's work in 1956. So that took a very long time to show as a public health benefit, and much the same story in the USA. Actually, smoking is a bit, bit of a bigger problem in the USA. And this is reflected in many other countries. I put female on because the equivalent for males would be prostate cancer, which is still high. Um, but the story for lung is much the same and for the other internal organs listed too. Here are some of the collaborators. Please don't try and read this. Um, 620 names, I haven't counted them myself, of people running trials or sharing their data or helping with this process of assembling the jigsaw. So uh, a great thanks to all of my brilliant colleagues who've made all this possible and it's still going strong at the moment. And special thanks <coughs> to all the poor patients um, who were trying to keep 
up-to-date records of and see how they fare through the rest of their lives, hopefully in a much happier way than they would have done half a century ago. Thank you. That's it.